If you don't practice test-driven development, it can seem a bit daunting. It certainly is a skill that you must learn. No one's born with the innate ability to practice this skill. But at its heart, it's really pretty simple. Test-driven development is focused on writing tests before we write the code and using that to guide the design of our code. People talk about mocking, using fakes or stubs, unit testing versus test first, different tools and libraries, but when it really comes down to it, it's a lot simpler than it seems. But you do have to pay attention to the signals that it sends you. At its heart, there are only three types of tests that you ever really need. So let's take a look at those three types of tests and let's use them to explore what test-driven development is really about. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. And if you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. Thanks to our sponsors, Harness, Equal Experts, Octopus, and Specflow. They're helping us to grow our channel, so please do help them in exchange by checking their links in the description below. If you'd like to learn more about test-driven development, check out the free test-driven development introduction on my training site, link in the description below. And do look out for my new training course, which is due out in the new year, Test-Driven Development and BDD Design Through Testing. I think that some people find the idea of test-driven development daunting. And after years of using it as an everyday practical tool, I confess that seems rather strange to me. But I can clearly remember when I started out with test-driven development, sitting in front of my computer with an empty screen thinking, where on earth do I start with a test for this? In reality, it's not really the testing that's the difficult part. It's the challenge of software design that TDD brings front and centre into our thinking. This is actually a good thing, but it can be a little bit daunting at first. For this episode, let's focus on the technicalities of testing. test driven development is about driving the design of our software from tests. Developers who practice test driven development value this much more than the testing itself, even though having the test is great and a really useful side effect. Test driven development is about, really about thinking about how our software works from the perspective of a user of that software. By that, I don't mean that you should be thinking about some end user. I don't mean you need to imagine someone using your software through a, a web page when you're writing a list or a database access layer. I mean something much simpler than that. If I'm writing a function to do something useful, I want to write it from the perspective of someone that wants to do something useful, rather than from the perspective of someone who wants to write some function that does something useful. It's probably me five minutes from now rather than me right now. The point is to separate the design of the interface to our code from the detail that we will add behind that interface later. Even for the tiny piece of behavior that is the focus of a unit test. Let's be clear about what we mean by interface too. I don't mean the Java or c -sharp language concept. I don't mean a REST API or even a function call. It could be any of these things and probably will be, or it could be something else entirely. What I mean is, is, is the meaning and semantics of how information is exchanged between two different separate bits of code. At the point where two different bits of code join, we need to be a little bit more cautious than anywhere else. These points in our system are more important, or should be, than the secrets that they hide from the other parts of the code. If your function call or message or whatever at these join points doesn't keep some secrets, then it isn't really doing its job. The best way that we can think about designing these places in our code to keep secrets is to separate what the code needs to do from how it actually does it. Think about what is the essential for us to provide to get the job done and what must be understood to use this code separately from what we need to know to make it all work. These are different things. Here's a simple example. 
Let's imagine that we wanted to write a function to draw a line. How we chose to specify that line is a very different problem to how we actually choose to draw it. We could define the line as a starting point and an end point on a coordinate system. We could define it as a vector, a start point and a length and an angle. We could imagine the start point being external to the line, some form of cursor, and only define it as a line 2 to a particular point. All of these are perfectly valid choices depending on the problem we're trying to solve. And none of them say anything at all about how we draw the line itself. We could imagine writing a test that specified our line in whichever way we chose to represent it. At this point, we're designing the external public interface to our line drawing code. This is going to give us a very different experience to the alternative. It's going to make us think of problems that perhaps we would otherwise miss. For example, what's the coordinate system that our lines rely on? Or how can we tell that the line is correctly drawn? Let's be clear about this. These are questions that we must answer if we hope to do a good job of writing this code. This is not extra work imposed on us by our need to test. These are good questions that we need to find answers to, if we mean to design a workable solution, that is. Testing has focused our thinking in a useful direction. Alternatively, if we begin writing the code first before we thought about testing it or thought it through, then we may think of all of these things but it's only down to us and how good a job we're doing on that day. Testing first forces us to think of some of these things because we can't write a practical test if we don't. If we choose to write the code first, then the chances are that we're going to expose some of the detail of our thinking in the interface to our code. Bottom-up design like this has the risk that it exposes some, if not all, of the details. Good interface design hides details, as we've already discussed. So if I start writing my line drawing function focused only on the implementation details, I could easily make mistakes. I could decide to make it work only for my display, for example. So if my display is 19 by 1920 by 1080, uh, I can't now draw lines on all of your display if it's 3456 by 2234. Forcing ourselves to think about what we really want of our code by writing a test first forces us to think about a different, more abstract, more useful aspect of it. Or it should. One important technique in helping us to achieve this focus and in helping us to write maintainable tests is, is that we don't break encapsulation for our tests. Our tests rely on the same level of abstraction, the same level of access to the code that they are testing as a user of that code does. Our tests only test through the public interface to our code, however that's represented. No backed doors in testing. So what we're really interested in in a test are the visible outcomes that our code exposes. The result of this line of reasoning is that we're left with only three different types of tests. There are only three types of outcome that are ever interesting. If we invoke some behavior in our code from a test, we might be interested in its direct response, the value that it returns or exceptions that it throws. We might be interested in how it changes the state of the code that we are testing. Or we might be interested in how that code interacts with other code in response. That's it. That's all there is. The first type of test is the most common. A test in this category will call some code, collect a return value or maybe an exception, and then check to see if the result was what was expected. Pretty simple, really. Here's a simple example. Let's imagine that we want to test a function that calculates the value of a percentage. Here's my test, and here is the code that makes that test pass. Asserting on the result of the call is probably the simplest test that we can think of. There are a couple of common mistakes that I see, though, even for simple tests like these. The first is to test lots of different values for variables, where the difference doesn't actually affect the code. 
Calculating 10% of 100 and 50% of 100 is really the same calculation from the perspective of the code that we're likely to write, unless we're doing something really dumb. The time for testing different inputs is either when the new tests demand new behavior, so changing our implementation, or when we're not quite sure of the result for some reason. Here's an example. Uh, I wanted to confirm that Python did as I expected and worked with decimals as well as integers. The other common mistake that I occasionally see is to duplicate the calculation or logic in the test itself. This is a bad idea for a couple of reasons. It first couples the code and test together. But even worse than that, you're not really making an assertion here. Your test is simply saying that the code I wrote is the code I wrote. Not really very helpful. Make your assertions definitive and distinct from the code you are testing. The next type of test is testing a state change of some kind. Here's a simple example. When I add items to my list, the size of the list reflects the change. So you need to be a little cautious for tests like these that you don't share any code between the tests, but these are not usually very problematic. They're usually pretty, pretty straightforward. The next problem with these kinds of tests, not really related to state change tests, but more to do with iteration, uh, it's, is the common mistake that I do see in tests more often. Don't iterate in a test. In computing in general, but certainly in testing, chicken counting is our friend. Zero, one, or many. If you want a test that your code can handle many things, two counts as many in, as far as chicken counting and tests go. So I'd accept this as a test, but not this. Why make your test slower and more complex than it needs to be? Test-driven development expert John Jagger says that the cyclomatic complexity of a test should be one. I like that. It means no loops and no conditions in your tests. The last type of test is probably the most complex and so potentially the most confusing. I've seen some fairly tangled code in tests like these as a result. These are tests that validate that your code interacts with some other code as you expect. The way that we test stuff like this is to insert something that's under the control of the test into the code that we're testing. There's some confusing terminology at this point. People differentiate between stubs, mocks, spies and fakes. I think, think of it this way. If we want to check that our code interacts with something else as we expect, we could do it in a couple of different ways. If the interaction that we are interested in returns some data to our code, we could cheat in a way that gives us a return value that helps us in our test. In this example, we'd like to test registering a user. But the registration checks happen outside of our code, in something called a registration service, let's say. Here are a couple of tests. One rejects the registration and the other accepts it. In each case, we have provided a stub, a dumb piece of software that simply replies the same way every time. In this case, with the acceptance for the first stub and rejection for the second. We could do the same thing with a fake. The difference between a fake and a stub is that a stub is dumb. It will return the same value every time. A fake is a little smarter. It has some behavior coded into it. In, in this example, our fake accepts users called Dave and rejects everybody else. Finally, there's another way that we can figure out what happened. We can use some code that records what happens while it's happening and then afterwards allows us to query it and make some assertions on whatever it is that we find. In this example, I'm testing something different. Now, we're interested in whether the call was made correctly or not. So my cheat is to pass a registration service into my code that simply records the last registration made. Then, my test can check to see if it saw what I expected it to. These are sometimes called spies, but probably more commonly mocks. Actually, if we're being strict in our definitions, a mock is something else. A mock is a generated thing 
with most mocking libraries you could do any of these jobs. People get in a mess with this kind of testing. There are lots of ways to mess up here, to be fair. The first one is with fakes. People try to make fakes horribly complex. This is common when testing complex systems, especially when the thing that you're trying to fake is an interface to some hardware. At this point, people start thinking about and talking about testing in simulation, and imagine simulators nearly as complex as the original hardware to do the job. You can go a long way with much simpler simulators, fakes, under the control of your tests. Stubs are pretty simple and don't usually cause too much problem, except people sometimes don't think of using them when they should. Mocks and spies tend to cause quite a lot of problems. There's nothing wrong with mocks or spies, they're a great tool. The trouble is that people often use them to simulate poorly designed interactions. If your code is poorly structured and tightly coupled, your mocks will be complex, nasty and tightly coupled too. This can get so crazy that people end up writing tests using mocks that are so complex that there's actually no real code being tested. It's all mocks. If you find yourself ever returning a mock from a mock, I recommend that you stop and think about your design for a moment. If you find yourself writing code to simulate some behaviour in a mock, I know that mock libraries let you do this, but should you? Should you really? If you find yourself validating that your code calls some dependency 17 times in a row with one set of parameters and then three more with another, then you have a problem and it's not the mock's fault. Test-driven development is a fantastic approach to design. The three types of tests described here are all that there are. I think it helps to understand that and think about it sometimes, and to think about which type you want to use and when. Fundamentally though, the real value of test-driven development is that it shouts at us when our design is going wrong. But you do have to listen for the messages that it's shouting at you. Thank you very much for watching.